members, professors, lecturers, academical staff, young budding surgeons, brothers and sisters in arms of orthopedics, and also I would like to give a special thanks to our nostril director, Professor Sarah, for coordinating this joyous full day. And without further delay, I would like to invite her to give a welcoming speech. Assalamualaikum, good morning and selamat sejahtera to everyone. Welcome, this is not a day of long and draggy speeches. I hope it's a day of fun and celebration. And uh, just in case uh, people are confused, NOSRAL stands for National Orthopedic Centre of Excellence in Research and Learning. So this is a little celebration of research and learning. And this year we are celebrating uh, graduation of our PhD and uh, uh, Masters in Research students uh, who are very precious. They're not many, but they're very precious to us. And of course, our beloved uh, clinical master students who have fought many battles and wars with us in the operation theater, in the clinics, etc., and in the lecture halls, and etc., etc. So, and also, we would like very much to welcome our alumni. I think there are lots of alumni around. Hi, Nabi. Uh, and some who go back quite a way. Uh, welcome back. Um, and we hope that. <coughs> With these talks, uh, we will become a little bit more all-rounder and that will propel us to greater heights in our own field. Because sometimes when, as my mentor, Professor Fo from Singapore said, that when you have your blinkers on, you can only see straight on. But if you have removed them, the whole world opens up to you and you can discover more truths. So uh, we are celebrating um, the research done in our country and also in uh, our center. And we hope that um, we can go along with our country uh, to discover new heights and to, to discover new truths and uh, yeah, to help orthopedic patients and other patients around the world. So welcome and I hope you enjoy this uh, light-hearted celebration with a serious note behind it and a serious aim. Uh, I think that's the best way of learning uh, happily learning, <laughs> and yet uh, remembering our aim in the background. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Sarah, for her welcoming speech. Now we shall proceed with uh, our guest speakers. The first speaker is from HKL, and uh, he is uh, Dato Dr. Rashidin Fazwi bin Dato Muhammad Nawawi. And please give a hand for his speech, tips and insights for an autobot dealing with lawyers and the press. Do, do I stand here? Thank you. Uh, selamat pagi, Assalamualaikum yang berbahagia. Dr. Dr. Mahmud Marikan ya, dan Datin. Uh, Prof. Tunku Sara, Director Nusral. Um, right, do I have a pointer? Does, it, does this work? So for autopods on dealing with lawyers and press, yeah? right? This is a disclaimer. I'm not the authority in this, this topic. Yeah? But what I tell you is that my experience so far in dealing with the press and the lawyers in my uh, 20 years of limited working experience. Much of this are actually my personal views. I've done some research which I think is relevant and I've talked to the lawyers especially in the AG chambers in Putrajaya and also the other lawyers. Yeah? Okay, right. So when do we actually cross paths with the press? When you do interviews, right? The press will come see you, you see you to publish an article in the newspaper. Yeah? Probably you are having no serial day, you call in the press. Yeah? Or some breaking news, dengue outbreak, patient have died, and they come and interview you. Okay? Then you cross paths with the press. The lawyers, litigation cases, of course, two ways, either you become an expert witness or, it, or you are the one getting sued. Okay? So these are the pathways that you and when you meet. So how to how to deal with these two 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 set of uh, people? Probably we 
take a bit of time to get to know them. Yeah. Um, I think there's a bit of. Uh, it was okay just now. I'm sorry for this. Yeah. But this is your typical Malaysian uh, reporter. Yeah. He works with the TV3. Most of them are ladies. And they are very young, in the 30s. And up to 75% of them actually have a degree in journalism or some sort of uh, mass communication. Yeah. So they are, they are smart people, you know. And 30% of them are specialized. They are specialized in sports, they are specialized in uh, international liaison, they are specialized in politics. Yeah. So they are, they are smart people, yeah. Okay. What about the lawyers? You know, lawyers in Malaysia, they go through, they have to go through a, a recognized pre-university course and they earn a law degree from a recognized university. They get their licensing and they do some sort of housemanship. This is called chambering for nine months. We, we do it for two years. Yeah. So, and they, they too have some specialty of masters available. They are masters in medical legal uh, law. They have law in, uh, for example, criminal law. They, they, they are specialized, something like our master's program. Yeah? To date, there's about 18,327 lawyers registered with the Malaysian Bar. How many doctors are there in Malaysia now? 50,000 plus. So, right? Now, since we have known their background, we are pretty much the same. You look at this. All three of us have a degree of some sort. You know, we undergo, underwent some sort of training. And all three have code of ethics. They have code of ethics for journalists, code of ethics for medic uh, doctors, and for lawyers. Yeah? So, but I think the similarities ends there, you know. Because at the end of the day, the del delivery of the end product, the reporter delivers as it is. For example, Let's say we have a bulletin University Malaya. Okay, I'm the reporter. The topic is Dr. Johan had a girlfriend. <laughs> okay. My job is to interview the security. Yes, we have seen him around in the campus. Yes, security have said that we have seen him around in the campus with so and so. My next duty is to go to the canteen, Machi Canteen. Betul ke? Yes. We've seen him eating with the houseman yesterday. Okay. Then I asked Dr. Johan, is it true? I deny all the allegations. Right? So all is printed out. It's up for us to decide. It's to stimulate a debate and we are free to choose. Who to believe? Yeah? What about us? We deal with the signs of uncertainty which is recognized by the court of law. For example, fracture of femur. What is the best treatment for me, doctor? Interlocking nail. Yes, it's the best. But 10% will get infection. I, I thought you told me this is the best. Yeah, it's the best. But 5% will have non-union. It's uncertain, you know, and it's recognized by the court. Yeah? What about the lawyers? It's basically yes or no. Adakah senjata ini menyebabkan kecederaan tersebut? Yes or no? Okay. Now, when this fellow talk to this fellow, it's easy. But when this fellow talk to this fellow, it's very difficult. I'm telling you. For example, fracture of a humerus plating was done with a resultant uh, radial nerve palsy. Doctor, if this surgery is done by a junior medical officer, would the chances of getting this higher? Yes. Lawyers happy, yeah. okay, right, good. Then you, you add some more. But even if I do this, also kena. So it's difficult, you know. I hope you, in future, you'll experience this, yeah. Right. So now, to put everything in a, in a simpler perspective, actually I make a birthday cake analogy, yeah. You give these three professions a task to make a birthday cake. You give them two a is the best of ingredients, B is the worst of ingredients. Yeah? And you tell them, just bake a birthday cake. Okay? Let's see how the cake comes out. This is the cake 
done by the press man. Everything is there. The sweet and sour, nice, you know. The bitter chocolate is there. The inedible candle is also there. So it's up to you. I do want to cut it here. Eat the best. Cut it there. You're the opposition party. Just take everything that is bitter. Or you can go in between and take both. That's the cake. Okay? Here's the cake by the doctors. It's very nice. Best of ingredients. Strawberry from Korea. Red cherry from Australia. Well done. Is this the best cake, doctor? Yes, it is. Shall I take this? Yes. But uh, I'm not sure whether you have lactose intolerance. You might get diarrhea, you know. But this is the best. I've done the best for you. I've give, I put the best ingredients, but 5% only you get some diarrhea. Okay? This is our cake. What do you guys think will be the lawyer's cake? Any idea? The lawyers will bake you two cakes. Okay? If they are fighting for you, that's the cake that will bake. If you, they are suing you, this is the cake. But mind me, all the ingredients is all there. But what is projected outside? Yeah? Okay, do you understand my analogy? Yeah? Now, I'm sorry for this. It's just, I, I'm not sure why it came out like this. So what are my experience with the press? So everybody have classification. I'm coming up with my own classification. There are three types. Type one, where you have direct contact with the press man and you are in control. For example, even though they interview me in a Chinese newspaper, I'm in control of the, of the um, contents of the article. The questions are given two weeks earlier. They set an appointment to see you, you sit down, you can make corrections, and two weeks prior to the publication, they will send you an email for another correction. So you are in direct contract and you are in control. So you don't have to be knowledgeable for this because you can go back and read. Yeah? The other type two is that direct contact with partial control. So they give you a broad topic, they tell you, okay, doctor, we're going to ask you this and this and this and this. That's about it. Yeah? This you must be well prepared because there's no turning back. Once you say something on live air, you just can't retract it. Yeah? So you need to be well prepared for this. Yeah? And you must remember, this fellow is a smart fellow. You know? Ali Iskandar is out of boarding school and he graduated from the United States. So the questions that they ask you, you, know, you, they just, you just don't get caught unawares. Yeah? You must be well prepared. Okay? Type 3 is the worst type where... You are not in contact and you don't have any control. You are you're having a good uh, night of bullying. Suddenly your friend sends you this picture and, and, and that's the end of your night. Yeah? You are as surprised as everyone else. Yeah? So there's a different of type of ethics which govern the online uh, media. Yeah? So, you know, you pretty much can't change whatever is, whatever is written. Uh, you know, the next day, the professor call you and ask, you know, Rashdin, what happened? So, such a bad management in HKL. You know, all you can tell her is that, you know, please don't trust what is written in the newspaper and hope that she believes you. Okay? So, hopefully, I hope that you guys don't have the experience of going through this type of uh, press <coughs> uh, encounter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Next, what about the lawyers? What are my encounters with the lawyers? There are two different pathways. I, I have been a defend, uh, accused and I have been an expert witness so many times. Yeah? Because once the government gives you promotion, they expect you to do a lot of work which you don't like. Anyways, it's miserable. Have, have you been to the high court in Jalan Duta? It's just, the, the atmosphere is just miserable. You know? it, it, it's... Everybody, everybody wears black. Black tudung, black shirt, no, not say white shirt, black. Everything is black. Even the bag that they haul around is black. You are the only person wearing blue with a tie and carrying an orange colored record pesakit hospital Kuala Lumpur. You stick out in, like a sore thumb in the court. Yeah? 
and I, I don't know, I find that the, 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 the discussion rooms are just, uh, I'd rather be in a labor room than, uh, and in the, you know. For me, it's a nuisance and uh, it's time consuming. I have more often than times than I have to cancel my OT. I have to, you know, I just have to go to the court. Because once all of you come back to KKM, once the two tigers call you, you have to go. I think that's the reason why the Jata Negara have a tiger, two tigers there. You know, you, you can't you can't run from the tiger. Okay, okay. It's emotionally draining. You know, you 20 years of work, three anugerah perhimpunan cemerlang under your belt, then suddenly you are told you are the worst person in the universe. It's just not not good. Yeah? It can be entertaining, an eye opener. You see. The record keepings are just pathetic. And you see some of the amazing surgeries done by our even senior colleagues. Eh? It, it just be, it's a roller coaster ride. Sekejap you rasa you menang, then you kalah, you menang, you kalah, you menang, you kalah. You, you, you go to it. Yeah? Yeah? To summarize this, this was written by a Canadian retired doctor. Yeah? You read this properly and you understand. For seven years it went on. Months of sitting in court, listening to what a terrible person you are. No one recovers from that. Yeah, It's in your mind every day, every minute. It changed the whole way I practice. The empathy I had that, was, that I was known for just wasn't there anymore. Okay, Every patient was a potential lawsuit. So hopefully we have to go through all this. Yeah. Now, this is how it looks like. The calling letter, whatever it is. Those are the two tigers. Tak boleh lari. Then your boss write your name there. Please attend. This is from KKM actually. But if you look at this, I've, I've taken out this. It's from, it's from AG Chambers. From AG Chambers there. Signed by the, signed by the lawyer. Yeah. Then it's like that, case CML something something, that's the name of the patient. Case CML means case medical legal, the number card kenalan of the patient and faculty which is Aida Padam lah. Okay, this, this patient, this I was called for that, to be an expert witness. So these are the things that they ask from you. So once you get this letter, you know, you, you just can't run, yeah? So what to do next? Relax. Easier said than done. This is your career, this is your life. You've been working for 20 years and suddenly you, you feel that, you know, you have to define your role. Are, are you getting sued or are you, are you the expert witness? Yeah? You read the summons properly. properly. Study the allegations. Yeah? Yeah. Next, what you do is trace the records. Trace the records and please don't meddle with the records. Yeah? Even if you found the right houseman, the right pen, Please don't add anything because you can never match the aging of the ink. You can never match the pressure of the pen that you were when you were uh, writing at the time. Yeah? It will just turn out as something new. That don't. It's all done. Just just forget about it. Yeah? Make a complete photocopy of the record and keep it with you. It can be thick. Just keep it. Yeah. So that you can study again and again and again. Study the records and arrange everything in order. You take one big piece of paper from the first entry, EDMO, ED Houseman, then uh, ED Nurse, EDMA, MO Orthopedic 1, MO Orthopedic 2, Orthopedic Houseman, Nurse. Then you study the whole thing. Everything will come into place. Yeah. Then you prepare. You have to read journals, you have to read your textbook, you talk to your senior colleagues, you talk to your lawyer friends to prepare for the case. And then you pray and wait. It takes about four to six years for them to call you to court. Yeah. Okay. When call, please come for the discussion. Banyak doktor tak nak datang. I'm sorry, I'm in Lahad Datu. I cannot come. I'm on call. I'm the only person there. You have to come. Because once the tigers have called you, you have to come as a Ministry of Health as a government servant, yeah? because you need to help your lawyers to define the medical jargon. They don't know anything. 
more often they be asking what is this doctor what is this what is CME what is HPE what they they don't know so you don't come you're not helping yourself yeah be honest up front be you can cheat you try to dig a hole now as you go deeper into the discussion the hole becomes deeper you can you just can just be honest up front this will help the lawyer to decide whether to fight or to settle you remember I told you one of the slides how they work they don't look for right or wrong they don't look for justice they're not actually looking for the truth they're looking to settle either it's your way or the other way around yeah? it's to settle you know? be prepared study and memorize the PhD textbook and journals and publication why do we lose three main reasons why we lose Documentation, lack of documentation, poor documentation, sometimes zero documentation, poor techniques in answering the questions. That's why you need to come and see your lawyers. They will coach you. So sometimes the, the, the lawyers, they ask tricky questions. Yeah? And failure to comprehend the facts. You just don't know the case. That's why you lose. Okay? Lastly, when you get called, you can be sad and concerned. It's, it's your career. Don't go into depression. Yeah, life goes on. Just continue doing your good job. Yeah, and you learn from the experience. The whole thing of, of you know, discussion and you know, court and everything like that. And don't be stupid. Stupid means doing the same thing and expecting a different result. And I ask the lawyer in this day and age, how do we avoid this? She told me. Give patient good advice, make good documentation, and give your best management, and hope they don't sue you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rajin, for an eye-opener. Uh, really give us some food for thought. I uh, would like to call upon uh, Professor Dr. Dr. Sarah and Dr. Rajdin to the stage for some token of appreciation. Yes, now we shall proceed to our second guest speaker from uh, our friend um, department, our rehab department. So I would like to call upon uh, Dr. Dr. Zaleha to give her speech. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. Good morning. And selamat hari raya Aidilfitri. First, judging from how you introduced me, you probably didn't know that I'm an orthopedic alumni. So I'm going to elaborate a little bit on that. But before that, I would like to really, really congratulate and thank Dr. Dr. Mo Marikan, Dr. Rogaya, and family for doing this for Nocerol. I think it's amazing. It's such a noble idea, propagation of knowledge and, and the rest of it. And I feel so fortunate, Sarah, you're doing it so creatively and not forgetting me. Okay, especially the young ones in the audience, you all probably are not aware. Perhaps the baby boomers, uh, Salon Jan, maybe even M. Jan may remember me. I started off in 1979 in orthopedics, the very third floor of orthopedics. And I was the first woman to join the academic staff. And Sarah was my little sister who came in 10 years or more than 10 years later. So you know what it was like to be the first woman in orthopedics? Thanks to all my eminent teachers in orthopedics, Professor Bala, Professor Subra, Professor Sen, I should add the late for all of them, and the other one, Prof Tambi. Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon, except for Prof Bala, who's still kicking around, rehabilitating himself. All these eminent teachers, they made me no different from any of the guys in orthopedics. I wasn't there to do orthopedic surgery. I was to do something different. That actually started all the differences in my life between me and orthopedic surgery. 
He made me sit down to do all, Professor Bala, made me sit down to do all the MCQs with Halili, with, um, oh God, all my <laughs> contemporaries, Zuraini and the rest, who were preparing for the FRCS part one. Remember at that time, there was no structured program. But Zaliha was going to be different. I wasn't going to sit for the FRCS. I was handpicked to do rehab because rehab unit was part and parcel of orthopedics at that time, started by Professor uh, Silva. Dr. Dr. Mount Morrican will remember this. Unfortunately, I wasn't around when you were a teacher. <laughs> and not just that. So what did it make me? It emancipated me, yet I had to keep being this feminine, sexy girl in the department, dare to be different, yet not be bullied. I was bullied by the guys. I, um, Vaikuntan, you're not in the group. Okay, one of those who bullied me, Vaikuntan and my contemporary. They made sure when they did the roster, Zaliha was in the roster everywhere, plus somewhere, which is rehab. Zaliha was in roster in a &E, in theatre, in the night calls and everything. I didn't cry. I braved it all. But I think that and the walking, the corridors, the corridor of knowledge from third floor orthopedics down to the dungeon of Oto 1, Oto 2, the brightly lit um, 88B and the black hole of the hospital. You know which was the black hole of the hospital in the 70s and the early 80s? The rehab unit. Professor Bala said, one day I came, actually I literally cried because there were so much problems. People were gambling at work. Prof. Bala told me, Zaliha, don't cry. You are in charge, you take charge. You do, you solve the problem. That actually toughened me up. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to do and make this thing I have with people with disabilities really a love affair. On top of that, I had very, very supportive leaders in the faculty and in the university. Professor Nku Aziz, uh, the late Professor Danaraj, Prof. Soma, Prof. Um, uh, Sinature, um, and many others, Jason Teo. These people were all so supportive. And I think I was lucky I have the genes to handle all these things around me. I grew up in the right environment, um, come out of uh, poverty into boarding school, toughen up, and then further uh, taught to cope with whatever in the, uh, in the university because it was really like that. It was tough, really tough. And because I was the only girl, I had to be secretary of MOA or assistant secretary sometimes. I have to organize all the parties in the department. And not just in the department, outside the department, because Zaliha was a girl, Zaliha can organize it. So people, that was me. And I still believe I am an orthopedic alumni, <laughs> but the orthopedic medicine component. And now, how did this love affair started? It started then. When Prabhala chased me, that was when the love, love affair started, 1979, when I was in pediatrics. Are you now ready to get up close and personal? I'm going to share with you some of um, my experience, my love affair with Sarah Colley, people who are differently abled. I still use the word people with disability because that's a legal term. Yeah, in the ACTA OKU or the Disability Act of Malaysia, it is, they are actually called Orang Kurang Upaya, not Orang Kelainan Upaya. So when we use a legal term, we just talk about the legal thing. We have to use the word people with disability, not people with different uh, ability. But that, that's just by the side. Now, uh, I, Shukur Alhamdulillah, I've been lucky in my very own immediate environment. I was born to a family that brought me up being concerned about others. Thank you very much. And from the time I got married, have my kids, my family have been very, 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 very supportive of my work. Now I can, now I'm ready to share with you some of 
this affairs that I'm going to make up close and personal with you. I don't know any, whether any of you were here just before I retired. This young lady, I'll start with her. She was 13. Her father had just died six months before that. He was a lumberjack. He was killed when the tree, when he fell the tree. She was, nobody could send her to school. Dad used to send her to school. So she took dad's motorbike. She was 13, met with an accident, had a traumatic amputation. Taken to two hospitals before she ended up in university hospital. I had a call one morning. The student said, oh, we have an interesting taste case to, um, uh, to have a session uh, with you. It was my clinical teaching session. I think it was 2003 or 2004. It was interesting in as much as the amputation was done yesterday and the orthopedic surgeon then want to discharge her then. That's a day after amputation. But the students were fantastic students. They were medical students. They took a full social history and they said that, oh, this cannot be. This patient comes from Triang, Kemayan, deep in the jungle of Pahang. If she's discharged today, she will never walk again. It's just a transtibial amputation. So what happened then? I called the, uh, the students presented and all. They, they taught the right way, which I thought, oh, that's good that the students think this way. And I tried to get a place for the girl because they want, needed the bed very badly, and I understand that fully. And I asked, I begged and said, could you please keep her for a day so I will look for a bed in PPOC or somewhere where I can place her and get her rehabilitated. Of course, at that time, rehab department wasn't uh, there yet. And he was kind, he kept. Did I find a bed anywhere? Yes. I found her a bed at number 32, Jalan 12 stroke 14, PJ, which is my house. Why did I do that? Because I believed what the student thought. She, and she wouldn't walk again. She was a runner in school. She was an athlete. So I kept her for three months in my house did all the rehab, and then communicated with the school afterwards. And she went home with three sets of legs. One for ordinary walking, one spare, one for sports. How could I do that? She didn't have money. But orthopedics taught me get your goal right. My goal was to make sure she gets to school and the rest of it she can fend for herself. So what did I have to do? She didn't have money. I had to raise money. So this is where we can drive politics. I communicated with MCA. They have a welfare section. Within two days, they raised 150000 What did I do? In my proposal, I said, she needs so much money, so many changes of prosthesis, and all that until she reaches the age of 25. So I need at least 150,000 cap aside for her. And I think that was the best thing I had done for her then. She's now married, as you can see. Still with the artificial leg, she kept changing. But because she uses it so much, the foot, even the good foot, she needed to change it, every, she needs to change it every six months. And the day before her wedding, the foot had to break. She called me, sent me a WhatsApp and said, Oh, kaki saya sudah pecah, kaki saya sudah pecah, macam mana ni? And she, wore, she said, Oh, tak apa, tak apa, saya boleh pakai kasut ini. What is the kasut? Crocs. I said, you are not walking down the aisle in your Crocs. So what did I do? I, I rang up the prosthetist. Thank you to the prosthetist brought the prosthetist to Tumalo, changed the leg, and she walked nicely the next day we attended the wedding. So thank you, orthopedic colleagues, for having uh, the trust in me. <laughs> By the way, 
I say up close and personal, why? A lot of the times I have to take things personally because the system is not there. Yeah, after three months in my house, she called me mommy. So then she became my foster daughter. Okay, the next story. Okay, this girl, I just discovered her last month, before Ramadan. The gentleman at the back, her husband, met her two months after she ran away from home in 2009, when after her parents died, after her parents died, the siblings wanted to send her to a, her to a um, home, and she refused. So that gentleman, that gentleman, appeared at her door three days after she moved to KL and said, I want to marry you. He converted from Hinduism to Islam and stood there and said, I want to marry you and take care of you. That's Hidayah, I think. Lucky girl. Okay? So, I'm sorry, I'm supposed to show you after this the, the wheelchair. So, all I had to do was something very small. When Perkin wanted me to see this girl in the community, she lived in a little uh, room, one out of seven rooms. So dangerous, do the cooking and everything down there. She looks so crippled, but she did. So I decided, okay, she has to be admitted, get rehabilitated. Within two weeks, she got into this wheelchair, and now we are in the process of getting her rehoused. Uh, thanks to the new Harapan government, someone like this will have some harapan in the PPR flat, which is <laughs> probably cheaper. Yeah. Okay, this little girl has tetraparitic spastic etitoid CP with regular fits. Has her head constantly like that. I wanted to get her seated up. So I had to use all sorts of gadgets to this is my favorite uh, program in Langkawi that I do, I go regularly. So I managed to sit her up with a terror suit. The aim is to get her seated up there. She's non-verbal, get her to use the computer. The mom is an ustaza. She can teach her, homeschool her. And that was, that, that's the aim. Unfortunately, she, her scoliosis got so bad, she got so much pain and so much fits. I haven't got to this stage yet, but um, we hope we can get there. The orthopedic surgeons in uh, Alosta, uh, trying to sort out. In the meantime, she's seated like this. She has learned how to use the um, iPad and the rest and the rest of it. Again, in Langkawi, the legendary island. I just love this island, just because it's been there since the Canberra era. So I thought, oh my God, something has to be done for the poor people who get poorer in the community that gets richer. People who come out of the Langkawi get rich. People who live in Langkawi get poorer and poorer. And the poorest of the poorer of the poor are people with disabilities, like this whole family of beggars. And they all have got some kind of disability. All four of them got some kind of disability. They live right in front of Langkawi Hospital. And uh, we, I actually handpicked them as they were walking, going to begging. But I failed until the husband died. I was hoping to train him to be a gardener because Taj wanted to employ him as a gardener, the hotel Taj. But they make more money begging otherwise. So I lost the battle there. Now, know the song? Love and marriage, they go together like a horse and carriage. In rehab, the carriage varies in size as well as in numbers. But one thing stays, there has to be teamwork. It doesn't matter how many people you have to put in that carriage, you have to team up. So we call this interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, and multidisciplinary uh, team approach in rehab practice. Yeah? This is a group of people there are only 13 people with disabilities there, but you can see many more numbers out there. Why? Because we need that big a team to help just 13 people. Yeah, this is just a small group of three. Yeah, the gentleman up there, yeah, he's blind and he's paraplegic. This gentleman became paraplegic at the age of 13. And by the time we met him, seven years later, 
he was just secluded in his house. All the complications of spinal cord injury. But with role modeling, we managed to get him out. He is now being trained as a wheelchair fencer for Malaysia. Yeah. Young gentleman, a young child, I think the earlier we start rehab, the better. But by the time we got into Langkawi, it wasn't too late. But uh, one of the challenges in Langkawi is actually to bring the, get the team together. The individual people are there. Sometimes you just need to inject a little bit. So I bring from PPM or somewhere from KL or from Alustar. But the main gist of people are there. You can see in, through all these pictures, sometimes you need a big team, sometimes just a small team, but you need a team. Yeah, otherwise you would. No one person who's differently able can be managed just one person. Okay. These three girls and, and this boy, they are different ages. They all have etitoid CP, tetraparotic, like I showed the first one. So what we try to do, when we have little resources, we cluster them together. And in the community, one of the mothers has volunteered the house to be used um, for a rehab facility instead of going to the hospital uh, for rehab. This young lady had leptospirosis and cephalopathy. Basic things could be done in Langkawi, but I had taken her out and uh, rehabilitated her, arranged for her rehab to be done. In PPM, similar to this gentleman, young police um, uh, officer, uh, who had a hemorrhagic uh, stroke. But when they go back, they become role models to other uh, people with disabilities down there. Remember, I mentioned about driving politics. In the beginning, when people ask me, are you into politics? You should get into politics. You can speak, you can convince people, you can talk to people, join politics. No way. How do you say politics is dirty? <laughs> but uh, sometimes I'm wrong. And I now believe that people like us have to drive the politicians, drive politics. And then each and every one of us can actually do it. This is an example of how I do it. I run a little project which I prepared for my retirement in 2005. It is called Bhakti Mind Project. I run it like I had run the setting up of the rehab medicine department here. And through that, because it's funded by Bhakti, the wives sleep with the husband. So through them, I managed to drive some political issues to get people with disabilities uh, inclusive. These are just some examples. Uh, our, this gentleman had been our uh, webmaster for more than 10 years. Complete tetraplegia. Yeah, managed in HKL initially and was interested to put um, uh, IT together, and uh, both of us worked on the Bhakti Mind project, collecting data. This young lady with autism, now second year medical student, and this uh, young lady with neurofibromatosis. Uh, all these people, I put them up there because we had used a lot of technology to push them through. I'm at the moment compiling a report for that work uh, so that it can be used um, uh, as examples to others. Uh, perhaps the latest that we have done through our Bhakti Man project is this. Upload what has been done at Permata Kurnia. I'm one of the founder members of Permata. And I think it's amazing that work that has been done in Permata Kurnia, but it has not reached out to many people. So we migrated all the programs of Permata Kurnia onto Bhakti Man project. And um, at least more than 2,000 people have benefited from the open line courses that we run for free for parents as well as for carers of children uh, with autism. Uh, now, for the uh, uh, portal itself, um, from 2004 to 2017, we had more than 2 million visitors, uh, uh, but we have uh, relaunched it. Um, uh, recently, with the addition of uh, open courses such as this one. We hope uh, with the latest Advachiman project, we'll be able to continually update, inspire, in make people integrate and get inclusive into, into society for the different types of disabilities that they have. 
I'm an opportunist, I have to declare. Every time I get an opportunity, I just grab it. Some of you may know this lady, right? Yes, somebody not. Nilofa, you know the story. At the, yep, okay. Um, um, this is last Ramadan at the Tadarus when we did a Katam Quran together. I actually didn't know who she was. <laughs> and the girls were surprised. You don't know who Nilofa is? I said, no, should I know? Okay. So the moment they say who she is, I went to her, say hello, and said, look, next year, can we do something together? We do an inclusive Quran reading together and do some community project together. Of course, she cannot say no, right? So something coming up. Now, in everything that I do, just like love, you have to sustain the love. Yeah, I have to use a sustainable living approach. I love having students around. And I'm so fortunate to be able to actually return after more than 10 years absence in the university to come back to the faculty to do some work with the master students as well as with the medical students. Yeah, you can see there are some master students. This is at our Therapeutic Sensory Stimulation Garden uh, run by Rehab Medicine, which I helped to set up um, in 2014, 2015. There's a group of uh, support group people with a spinal cord injury. And there are lots of students around. You see, how not to fall in love with them? Yeah? And there's so much potential. Doesn't matter how disabled they are. I've recently, in the last uh, 10 years or so, extended a bit of my work outside Malaysia, uh, particularly in the poorer areas, West Sumatra, Laos, Myanmar, and some bits of China. Um, and um, in every position that I am in, I try to actually use it to the fullest. For this particular one, I went to West Sumatra, not formally, informally on my own, uh, as an executive board member of the ASEAN University Network for disabled people policy. Why? Because there was money, scholarship, to give people with disabilities who wants to do their master's and PhD. And I thought this is fantastic. So in Malaysia, this is not difficult because you can just pass the word around to all the universities and the schools. So I decided to go away uh, uh, to the poorer countries. This is one uh, chap, tetraparitic, epitoid, CP, oh, with severe speech disorder, who managed to get his bachelor's or, or enter a bachelor program. He's now graduated, and I was eyeing him to um, try to offer him or rather um, get him to apply to do his master's in disabled people policy so he can help other disabled people uh, in, the, um, uh, in Indonesia. He's now gotten the, the, the um, uh, scholarship and is starting the program in Elanga University in, in Surabaya. I'm also passionate about getting people to communicate. I think <sighs> communication is so important. When you're in love, you have to communicate, right? If you don't communicate, you cannot tell the other person how you feel and, um, and, and the rest of it. So, authentive and augmentative communication has been my passion for particularly children with learning, learning disabilities. I was able to do this in Kuala Gula when I was working with Al Buhari International University for two years. Uh, and the beauty is, the students I got at that time were international students from the poorest countries of the world. Uganda, Uzbekistan, um, um, Vanuatu, uh, Somaliland, that sort of countries. And again, <laughs> there were about 13 of them who, were, who really wanted to do this project with me. And because they didn't have money, I actually had used my salary to fund the work that they do. My salary at that time, because it's a walk-up university. So I thought, oh, it's fair enough to teach my salary to to fund the, uh, the work. And these people have graduated. Some are doing their postgraduate now here and away in America, most of them. And for those who have gone back, they send me messages to say that they're starting something similar in their very own country. So I think I'm very fortunate in my lifetime, I'm able to do that. These are some of the patients. There's a lot more that can be done to change further. There is definitely a lot of positive change in the community. There are people who are coming out and you can see them more than more compared to the past. Have friends who are people with disabilities get to know us. 
we are just like you and we have needs just like you and get to know about our needs more so that you know how you can be of assistance to us but don't treat us like charity. If you're going to wait for society to change, that's not going to happen. I do not believe in that. You've got to make your way, right? Um, for us, I don't believe in a, a future that's already been predestined. I believe the future is there for you to create it, right? Everybody is given this ability to create things. We're looking for that one individual who cares, you know, and so I'm asking you to care. I'm asking you to see yourself in these children's eyes, that you are their hero, that you are the person who's going to make a difference of whether the child is going to be somebody or potentially be somebody or someone who's just going to waste his or her life away. The only thing that's stopping you is you, right? All you need to do is just go out and try. Uh, will you fail? Most likely, yes. But try enough times, you will succeed. Who, who, who guarantees you success? Nobody. Yeah. Whether you're able, you're disabled, nobody guarantees you success. And if you look at all the successful people, where did they get their success? It came from within. It came from them wanting that, you know, and going out and achieving it. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's it. Just, just do it. Just go out and claim what's yours. These are some of the patients that we've managed in the PPUM who actually, like many other patients, would ask us in rehab, how long do I have to keep seeing you? My answer usually to them is, whenever you need to see me, or in some instances, whenever, when I die or when you die. <laughs> okay, some of you may know about this, people with disabilities who have shine in science and technology. Our very, very own Indran Mahadevan from Klang, and these are the international ones. I'll go very quickly in the interest of time. So, this is my favorite for this year. The Jibba baby, isn't he cute? And he competed against all other babies. I think we are seeing it now. The inclusivity in the development of people. Sarah, you are right. The word should be differently abled. It's a whole spectrum. Yeah. And Madeline, some of you may have known about Madeline. She appears in Vogue. Yeah. Uh, this is my final one. You have to like this, especially autopods. I was born with partial limbs, so I have to be adapted to the music, to the choreography, but that's okay. I live my life adaptively. My heart is... very happy because this is going to change many things, especially in my country where the people with disabilities have been disregarded. So, you cannot blame me for opening up this love affair to you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Zaliaoma, for the inspiring speech. We are grateful to having you here giving speech in the Nostral Day. Again, I would like to call upon Professor Dr. Dr. Sarah 
and Dato Zareoma for some token of appreciation. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, announcing the arrival of our third speaker, please welcome and give a big round of applause to Yang Berbahagia, Dr. Dr. Zamin, Haji Zamin Zuki bin Tan Sri Muhammad Zuki to give his speech, Songkit, Priceless Art in Gold and Silk. Please welcome. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good morning. Salam Aidil Fitri, Salam Hari Raya, Hari ke-10 Syawal. So, uh, it gives me great pleasure to come back to my alma mater. And um, my teachers are here. Whenever I see my teachers, I always will uh, salam them. So, Professor Tukusara, Professor Zaliha are my teachers. Um, and um, I was here not too long ago, uh, way back in 1985. How old were you all in 1985? But that's when I got my first degree. And I came back again here uh, not too long ago, 1994. Okay, so I'm a double degree alma mater from University of Malaya. It gives me great pleasure to return here and uh, once again uh, share with you uh, my passion and also something which I really love. I'd like to thank uh, Nostral, especially Professor Tengkuzara for inviting me again. Um, to share my passion. I'm uh, delighted to actually uh, share with you today something that is close to my heart, and that is Songket. And today for the first time also, I'm delighted to introduce my wife here who taught me about Songket. And there she is, okay, Dr. Noria. She's here for the first time. She, she normally ne never attends any of my lectures. Okay, so I'm under immense stress because if I don't do well, I don't have lunch today. <laughs> okay. okay, today uh, the topic of my talk is about art, and this art is something which is dying, and it is something which is available in Malaysia, and it's priceless because uh, it keeps on dying, and there are not many people who keep this art going. Okay? Uh, there's many, many things in Malaysia that is dying, apart from Songket, okay, grease making making of uh, very beautiful um, carvings and then also artwork in terms of bronze and gold. So let me share with you the next 15-20 minutes. And there's a slight twist because, as you all know, I like to bring in the real stuff, the real thing. So as I'm talking later, be prepared to be surprised because I'll be bringing in the real Songket and they'll be coming down the stairs. Okay, floating on the bodies of real human beings. Okay, please, please feel free to look at them, take their photos. But at the same time, I always do something different and that I got my camera here. And before I start, I'll take a photo of all of you here, lovely ladies and gentlemen. And at the end, I'll take another photo. So if anybody's sleeping, my KPI has not been achieved. Okay, so everybody has to be awake. Let's start the ball rolling. And uh, Songket is actually a word, a Malay word, and it's called Songkit, and that is to hook. Okay, uh, and it's an old Malay word. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, the origin of Songket, okay, many of you didn't realize, Songket actually came through the Silk Road. Because as you all know, Songket derives from two main key substances, which is gold and silk. And silk, of course, comes from China. And gold comes from many various parts of the world. But the artisans in weaving silk were actually the Chinese. And the artisans in handing gold were actually the Indians from mainland India. And all of these uh, promulgated and homogenized somewhere in Persia okay, and Iran. And they all moved eastwards and coming down the Silk Road. Now, song, uh, Songket can come from cotton. But the original Songket, ladies and gentlemen, that you want to own is one that is made from pure silkworm. Okay? And the silkworm has to be killed and it has to be harvested. And then the various colors 
of the weave uh, put into the fabric. But finally, it's gold. Okay, it's 99.9% .9 that gold that goes into the songket, and that's what makes original songket very expensive. There are many variants of gold: 916, 999. Okay, there's 912, and there's a 18 karat gold. But the one that goes into songket. Is 24 karat gold and that makes it very very expensive so one word of warning uh, this silkworm cannot be treated like cotton because it's biological so don't put it near anything acidic don't put it anything near alkaline and gold has to be treated well please do not dry clean your songket because probably you will lose half the gold in the dry cleaning so if you want to wash your songket you have to be very careful okay, maybe if we have time I'll, I'll teach you later after talk how to take uh, care of your songket Okay, we go on to the traditional structure of songket. Do we have a, a, um, a songket here with us so I can show to them uh, the songket? Is it coming up there? The songket, the green one? Okay, so uh, the traditional stru structure of the songket is divided into four parts, which is the tepi kain, okay, the body itself, the body of the songket, the kapala, okay, and this is one of my lovely models coming down. As you can see, she herself is wearing a songket, okay, and this is Nurul Isahada bringing down a typical Tranganu songket. Isahada, don't go away. You've got to be my letter turner today. The Vanna White. Okay. And uh, this is the songket, original. You can see the kapala is here. Down here is the pengapit. And then the tepi kain, finally the badan. Okay. So everybody has to get a songket which has a kapala. Because the kapala has to stay all the time at your batok. Okay, I'm also one of the models. Thank you, Nuris Hada. You can bring it up. Anybody who wants to touch it along the way can touch the songket only. Yeah? Touch the songket. Okay, next slide. Now, this is something Okay, this is something I want to share with you. Actually, uh, I want to show you how it's made. Okay? Uh, this is very tedious work. Okay, you had to go to a Tranganu factory for this and see how songket is made, um, you know, thread by thread. Now, uh, people say that uh, between men and women, okay, women are more meticulous to making songket. Uh, in one way, that is true. The majority of songket makers, traditional hand-woven songket weavers are women. But the virtuosos and the master of masters are men. So, first you must ask when you want to buy a songket, ini pupu abuat ke jatai? You have to ask them that question. Okay, typical Terengganu lingo, pupua. So, if pupua is a bit cheaper, kalau lelaki buat, is expensive. And, um, you know, royalty buy all their songket from either Kelantan or Terengganu. And the other thing that you have to make sure, ask them, how long was this songket made? If they said so, this songket was made within two months or maybe two days, uh, it's not worth its money. Okay, songket has to be given the prestige of time. Remember last year, I told you carpets are made within one to two years in Persia. So, songket also takes some time. Okay, let's move on and now go to the next part of my talk, which is the design of the songket. Now, as you can see, uh, watches are priceless art in gold and platinum. But watches can last very long. Whereas songket, if you don't take care of it, it won't last very long. This is... Uh, um, Udemars Piguet and it is in platinum and diamonds. It's very expensive. Okay, you have to wait for it and wait for it to come. This is imported. Okay, everything that I've talked about, the carpets, uh, and before this have been imported. Whereas Songkit actually comes from Malaysia. Okay, and this is the motif. Now the motif is the main element of the design. And ladies and gentlemen, later when my models come down, look at the motif. The motif is the one that you want to look because it goes through the ages from the times of the Malacca Sultanate, Majapahit, Tranganu royalty. The motifs have not changed much. Let's go on and see the motifs. Okay, you have got different type of motifs. Now, if you want to do a PhD or master's in Songket, then probably you got to study this. You'll be asked in your viva, definitely. I'm not one of the examiners, how I wish. But we have many, many motifs and some of them actually are old motifs. They come from five, six hundred years old. Look as my models are coming down, you will see uh, old songket, very old songket, belong to my late father, my grandfather, and then you have young songket. Okay? And even the uh, tonkolo or the tanja uh, is old songket. 
Okay, this song kit is uh, won during uh, receiving of awards or dato ship. Okay, so they are very old song kit. Um, the cloth comes from Kelantan, from Trunganu, from Kedah, but the ultimate is the one that is made in Trunganu. So have a look as they go up and down. You can actually see, you know, the motifs inside. Next, and uh, the puchot rebong is the one that is one of the old motifs. Puchot rebong, okay. Bunga orchid is a new motif. Down inai is an old motif. Look at the motifs. And this is what puts the value of the songket to the high level. Ladies and gentlemen, keep in your mind the value of this songket. Okay, later, I will ask you, what do you think is the value of this songket? And those who get the right answer, okay, it's not the IKEA carpet of last year. The IKEA carpet, some of you took a millions. This one now is right in front of your eyes. And you can actually see and determine. But be warned. One of this songket is, uh, uh, not to say a hope, but it's an original imitation. Okay, so you have to find out which one is the original imitation. By the time you finish listening to my uh, lecture, you will be experts in finding out which one is the, the fake or the hoax. Okay, next. Now the patterns. The patterns are also crucial in determining the value of the songket. So you have rhomboid patterns, you have checkered patterns. You can see the different patterns here. Okay, you have got spotted patterns, scattered motif, bamboo shoot, shoot patterns. Next, you have got old patterns and new patterns. Okay, these are old patterns here. The one that Is is wearing. Okay, Is is preparing to go to the istana. Is put up your hand. Is okay. He's preparing to go to the istana. So he actually has to wear all black, and he has to, he cannot wear any colorful pattern. Okay, especially if you're going to mengadap the king. Eh? You have to wear all black. Uh, next slide. And these are stripe or branded patterns. So if you can see, I have to do a test type of here. I don't have a... I hope you all can hear. Okay, these are old patterns. Very old patterns. These are old patterns. Okay. Uh, Serenity here is wearing a very ancient pattern. You can see very, very old. You don't make it anymore. Okay. Very old pattern now. The new pattern is on... Test, test. Go to Tungkuma. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Okay. And then uh, Bavani here is wearing a very new pattern. They are also holding up new patterns here. And finally, Mugilan is wearing an extremely new pattern. Yeah? But which one is the most expensive, you think? Can you all hear me? Okay. Let me go back to the slides now. And uh, my models, I think uh, you can twirl around and show them the motives. Now, you also have check patterns. Move on. And you have spotted or scattered motifs. You can see one of them is wearing it. Uh, very, very difficult to make, Tonton and Pompuan. Uh, it takes like six, seven months. Move on. Bamboo shirt patterns are the Chorak Puchot Rebo. Okay, very easy for you to identify. Always ask the person who sells it, Ini Chorak Gapo ni? Chorak Gapo. If you go to Kelantan, you have to speak in their language. Or not, they'll charge you triple the price. You know? Okay, next slide. And the central part of the Songke is called the Kapala Kain. And Iza, can you turn around? Turn around. Uh, this is how Iza wears it. But if you go to Pahang, then you have to wear the something differently. Okay. Now that is totally not in the context of this talk today. How to wear your something? But for all those who uh, one day hope to get uh, award, it can be any award. You must learn how to wear the something according to the style of the royalty of that state. So Pahang, different way of wearing. Kelantan, different way of wearing. Kedah, different way of wearing. And even the Tanja, the Tengkolo, is different. Okay, so if you get a uh, Datuk ship from four states, you've got to own four of these Tanja. Okay, it's not easy, but you've got to buy it, and each one costs quite a bit. Ladies and gentlemen, do you remember this? I showed this last year. Do you remember? Yes, okay. Carpets, priceless art in wool and silk. So those of you who attended my talk last year, you are experts now. And you can go to any Persian carpet store. But just to tell you, this carpet uh, was uh, auctioned recently in uh, Sotheby's for 13 million. 13 million. So carpets are expensive. And those uh, who have followed me to India, I think a few years ago, uh, they are experts now. Okay, they are experts. Wei Min is not here. And Wei Min followed me to India. And we went to haggle for carpets. And I got very expensive carpets. Today, those carpets are worth five times their weight. No? So carpets are another thing that are priceless. But carpets, Malaysia doesn't make them. Okay, next slide. 
Now, Songket, it's a diverse art. You can get it from Kelantan, from Chengganu, from Johor, Pahang. Uh, I think personally the best is Kelantan and Chengganu. Lah. These are the best. And let me share with you a little bit about the evolution of Songket. Now, Songket actually is from the olden days of the Malacca Sultanate. And it did not originate in Malacca Sultanate. It actually came from Palembang and Majapahit. This is a very old picture taken from the 19th century, 18-something. This is a royal courtesans, and you can see full bodysuit of Songket. Okay, can you see the Pachot Rubung there? And you can see the Bunga and all that. These are all motifs. They are here today for you. The motifs are still there. Okay, move on. And these are today. Okay, this is on the catwalks of New York, Milan, Paris. Songkit is now seeing a resurgence. We are seeing it on the international catwalks. And you can see full body suite of Songkit here. And these are very expensive Songkit. Okay, uh, this takes maybe a few months to make. And the model also has to be very careful to carry them. Huh? This is triple layer motif Songkit in maroon. Beautiful. Okay, next. And uh, we also have a lot of our Malay weddings. And some of you who are marrying into Malay family or are interracial marriages, you actually have to learn how to wear this. Okay, not too long ago, one of our specialists, Kusosian, got married in Ipoh and she had to be able to wear the Songket and carry it well. Okay? So Songket is something to last a lifetime. So make sure you don't uh, borrow or beg or rent. Buy your own Songket. Next. Move on. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the royalties in Songket. Okay, Songket has always been one of the cornerstone of the royalty. You can see uh, Yang Duli Yang Mahamuli, Yang Dipetuan Agong, wearing a traditional Kelantani Songket, the Tanja also is Songket, okay, and then Tun Dr. Mahathir Muhammad wearing a black Songket. Uh, black Songket is a must, you must have a black Songket. And then our formal Armalhum, okay, Duli Mahamalia, Sultan Abdul Halim wearing his traditional black Yang Dipetuan Agong Songket with gold interlace. Huh? Okay, move on. The gold is the one that makes it very expensive huh? because of the gold thread. Now, uh, Songket also is seen in India, Indonesia, and now Pakistan is doing a lot of Songket. So, if you can see, Pakistan Songket can be seen in um, Masjid India, can be seen in Wisma Yakin, and the design is almost identical to our design. So, how do you make a difference? It's very easy. Okay, You have to feel the fabric, feel it, touch it and then turn it around, the other way around. The Pakistan and India Songket is all machine made. They're not handmade. So their weavings are very straight, very diagrammatic, very systematic. Whereas ours, if you turn it around, later if you take the Songket and turn it around, you can see it's like you know, haphazard bachelaru behind, eh? not the one in front. Move on. And then we have designs from India. This is an Indian design. Very heavy on gold. Okay, Indian designs are now freely available because the Indians are very good at making sari. So it's just a step over to make Songket. Uh, they're not that expensive. And then another design here, okay. This is an Indonesian design, very heavy on gold. Indonesian Songket is very expensive, especially the one from Palembang and from, from Jambi. Okay, and you must not damage it because it contains a lot of gold. Move on. The next uh, Songket, okay, this is another Songket from Pakistan. And uh, you can see it's, it looks nice, beautiful, but when you turn it around, you can see it's machine made. Move on to the next slide. Okay, now I'm going to uh, let you know that the two top Songket in Malaysia is Trengganu and Kelantan. Okay? And many of you here probably have one Songket from Trengganu or maybe one Songket from Kelantan. Now, what Songket is this from? This one is from where? Now, I've taught you quite a bit. Floral design. Okay, you can see the motifs. Very traditional. Next slide. And then compared to this one. Okay, you can see the design. Okay, it's different. Okay, very systematic. Okay, move on. Okay, those last two was either from Trengganu or Kelantan. But I'll keep you guessing. Now, woven or printed? Now you know whether it's Malaysian, India, Pakistan, whether it's Trengganu or Kelantan, or woven or printed. Okay, you can see here, this is woven. And most of them are wearing woven songket. But there's one of them, the odd one out, who's wearing a prefabricated original imitation. Up to you to find out. Whoever finds out and is the first to tell me will be invited for our Hari Raya open house on the 12th of July in Sungai Bulo Hospital. Everything free of charge, transport also provided. Okay? 
So you can makan until you drop lemang, ketupat. And, but you got to tell me before I finish uh, at the end of this speech, uh, which one is the original imitation? Move on. And this one, as you can see, is a printed songke. Okay? This is what you can get in the Pasar Malam. This is what you can get in Masjid India. Very cheap. Okay? It's only for 400 or 500 ringgit. Very cheap. Okay? If the songke is less than 1,000, there's a, there's a real, real chance that it's probably an original imitation. Okay, just like you go and buy your Rolex watch at Pataling Street. Okay, if they charge you 500, 600, it's an imitation. If they charge you 3,000, it's an original imitation. Okay, if you go to the Rolex shop, it's nothing less than 25,000. Okay, move on. So Songket is like this because it's a dying art. And if you turn it around, okay, this is an original imitation. You can see that it's machine made. Okay, the sutures, okay, the way they weave it is like on a single place. But... If you look at the original songket, the real thing, the behind it, the whole length from the top to the bottom, you can see the sutures, okay, the weave going through it. Move on. It's like something like a surgeon doing a bootleg weave. Okay? Now, is it an expensive art? What do you think, ladies and gentlemen? Okay, most of the sipus, the togurus are all dying. And their children don't take over the art. Like why they pergi jual multi-level marketing or go and jual budu or something like that. You can make more money. Okay? It is a dying art. Now, this is uh, original songket uh, from royalty. You can, you can see the brocade, the weaving, the motifs. This is very expensive. And this songket costs 200,000 ringgit. Okay? It's on a model. This is not one of the royalty, but it is very expensive. Okay, move on. I don't have a 200,000 songket here or not. Probably I got to get security vans to come here. But you can go off in a minute. Now, this is a songket from Palembang from Jambi, very heavy on gold. And trust me, it is heavy. When you wear it, you feel like you're going to drop down. It's heavy. This one is mostly well worn for special Indonesian weddings. Okay, it's very heavy in gold. And after that, they lock it up in the family safe room and they don't see it again until the next wedding. Okay, very heavy. Uh, now, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, advertise for any Songket company, but if you do want to buy Songket, you have to go to reputable sellers. So all these are the reputable sellers, but this is the one that sells the songket that is uh, normally for beginner, for beginner. Now the one that is for advanced, I didn't put the name here for obvious reason. If you want, you come and see me, and I will tell you where to buy for the advanced, the master's degree songket. Okay, uh, that one will cost you ten thousand and above. Okay, that one you have to wait for it. it. Takes maybe six months to one year, and you can actually tell them what design you want. Okay, you want a design which is Maybe uh, sesuai, or for your character and for your color. Maybe you might like blue. Like I love blue, so I'm wearing blue, and my wife is wearing blue. Okay, sometimes I might want to wear pink, so I'll ask. So what we do is, we buy the songket first, and then we go to the tailor, and we ask the tailor, we want to make a baju to fit this songket, and not the other way around. Huh? Because the songket is more expensive than the baju. Okay, next slide. Ladies and gentlemen, songket is a dying tradition. And I'm very sad to see that all my original songket makers of 20, 30 years ago are no more around. Okay? They are dead. And their children are not following. Okay? So a lot of the motifs, the patterns, and the sentiment of making songket is gone. One day, and that day be, may be within my lifetime and your lifetime, uh, songket will all be imported. And it will be no more made in Malaysia. Okay? And we have lost one of the art. Okay, as you all know, keris making is dying. Uh, it's dying faster than songket. And making of Prahu, Prahu Laya and Pulau Duyong, Trenganu is dying. Okay? So we don't have the artisans of last time. Move on. Ladies and gentlemen, songket fetches five to six figure price tag today. So these young models, the next generation, are very lucky because they have with them now something which is very expensive. And it is my hope and wish that uh, all of us here will continue this tradition of Malaysia, which is Songket. And not only Songket can be worn as a samping, but Songket also can be worn as a kain. Like uh, Joey here. Joey, move forward a bit. Yeah, she's wearing my Songket, which is uh, pure gold. And she's wearing it as a kain. Actually, that is my samping. But she's wearing it as a kain. Okay, that's Joey. Next slide. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to leave you with this prophecy or this tagline. 
I hope you have enjoyed my short talk. You never really own the Songket, ladies and gentlemen, but you are a temporary guardian for the next generation. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for listening to my short talk. And I hope that I have been managed to entertain you. And please take time to see how the Songket is, touch and feel it. And I hope that uh, I wish all of you a happy time in buying Songket for the future. Selamat Hari Raya, Adi Fitri. Maaf Zahayan Batin. Thank you to Datu Dr. Haji Zamin Zuki for his um, insightful speech on Sungkit. I would like to call upon uh, Datu Dr. Zamin and Professor Datu Dr. Tukusara for the ceremonial token of appreciation. And then the word grew louder and louder Till it was a battle cry I'll come back when you call me No need to say goodbye Just because everything's changing Doesn't mean it's never been this way before all you can do is try to know who your friends are as you head off to the war. Make a star on the dark horizon and follow the light. You'll come back when they call you. No need to say goodbye. You'll come back when it's over No need to say goodbye Okay, this is where I make a speech So congratulations to all our students, all our master students And all the best to all of you in your new professional life Welcome to the UM family You will be our family forever and you will be our colleagues. All the best and please make us proud. Wherever you go, you're carrying our name. You know 
pulsa dan bangsa kami junjung cita-cita luhur berpaduan seluruh negeri seia sekata sehati sejiwa menghadapi cabaran kami Tercinta kibarkan panji kebesarannya kami rela menjaga namamu sejahtera Malaysia. One more time. Sejahtera Malaysia. Everybody, let's bow. Thank One, you. two, three. <laughs> Thank I would like to call upon the next speaker, Miss Suhaili Muhammad, to give her speech on Nostral Publications, Awards, and Linkages. Please give a round of applause. Assalamualaikum and um, hi everyone. Uh, my topic is uh, a bit different from what we have today, so I hope everyone is bear with me and uh, I will try to finish as soon as uh, I can. Okay, so today uh, is about publication, linkages, and awards because there are so many data that we have in Nostril. So uh, Prasara asked me to just focus on last year's achievement. So uh, in terms of published papers in uh, last year. All the data from um, our web of science, um, which actually uh, gather all the uh, uh, research uh, information uh, in uh, uh, published papers in the world. So, um, as for last year, we have about fifty-four uh, published papers. That include <laughs> thank you. That's everyone's um, achievement, and um, I can uh, I will say that uh, it's a teamwork. Um, this inform this uh, papers is from uh, accepted papers uh, uh, last year and also accepted papers in 2016. That makes uh, our papers 54. And not to forget, uh, we also published in non uh, ISI publication, uh, mainly in Malaysian Orthopedic uh, Journal, uh, also in the Scopus list. Uh, we have eight papers, and uh, most of our papers is original articles and review papers. Because UM uh, is not um, uh, uh, considered or counted for uh, proceeding papers or proceeding conference papers. So these papers contribute by all teams, including bone bank, uh, sport, trauma, LRS, uh, hand, spine, onco, DGR, also tissue engineering group. So in terms of quartile ranking, quartile ranking is a, 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 a general ranking based on impact factors. So we, in last year, we published in Q1 and Q2 um, 15 papers in Q1 and Q2s, and also uh, Q3, uh, 8 papers, and Q4, about 10. And also there are few, there are six papers that we published. Actually, um, we published in 2017, but this year, when I checked in the website, in the top web of science, the journal is already dropped, uh, meaning it's not longer in the web of science. And also, the, there are eight uh, papers in um, uh, Scopus. I'm sorry for uh, too many words here, but I just want to highlight, um, we actually publish um, mainly in general of orthopedic surgery and also spine. And also here. But we also uh, publish more in um, um, Numerous journals such as um, if, I think if you can see here, um, Pure Journal, um, Gait and Posture, Cell, Cell Tissue Organ, and so on. These are the journals that we published uh, last year. 
So in terms of research areas, our publication um, publish more in orthopedics and surgery, uh, but then there's a few other research areas that we also um, publish in, uh, such as cell biology, engineering, biomedicals, uh, more to basic science, and also social, social science. For the citation report, citation report means that how many people cite your papers. Um, as for the last year, we have uh, hash index 6, and every citation per item is 2.58, and some of time cited 53. So these are the top 5 that paper um, received most uh, time cited. Uh, main, actually, all these five is our clinical research. Um, with the top one is from spine group. So, okay, with the um, if you, it, this is very good achievement because if you can see this pap paper published in uh, January, in May two thousand seventeen, but already received a, a citation uh, from two thousand seventeen and also two thousand eighteen. Okay, how about the linkages? Um, because there are so many um, linkages that we actually um, engage, but I just uh, list um, of the uh, universities and uh, affiliation here that actually share publication with us. So if you see the list, uh, we actually collaborating uh, with um, so many um, universities in the world, including local university, local hospital, and also Uh, including the Europe uh, region, Asian region, and also um, Asian region. Okay, how about awards? Um, last year we have a uh, few awards. Um, Prokamaro received um, this award. I'm not sure what. I think this award is about um, uh, the review. Uh, review that he received. Maybe Prokamaru can explain the detail of this award. And also um, MOA, I think we every year we we always um, uh, re main recipient for the MOA awards, including um, P. Balasubranian uh, Best Published International Medicine Papers Award, and also um, Subir Sanguta Best Published Clinical Paper Awards. I think this year we also won the awards. The P. Pala Subramanian Award uh, won by Provivac and Onco team, and also uh, Subi Sengupta uh, Award won by Prof. Kwan and uh, Spine team. Okay. Also, uh, Spine team won this um, prestigious um, one in prestigious um, event by Economic Innovation. They won the Silver Innovation Product under Healthcare and Wellness category for the project of this uh, portable device for preliminary diagnosis of sclerosis and shoulder symmetrically assessment, healthcare and wellness uh, category. Um, I just want to highlight that Dr. Chan, even though he's not no longer our staff, but he won the best lecturer okay, for 2015 and 16 by uh, Dean of Faculty of Medicine. Um, not to forget, um, we also um, Receive a few awards in the um, orthopedic conferences other than MOA. And this is a spine uh, spine society um, congress. I think the student or fellow that won this award. And also this this uh, uh, our master student. Um, yeah, this one I also won this award. <laughs> this one. Uh, actually, I just want to highlight. Not just uh, our academic staff contribute, but also students and also non-academic staff, including uh, uh, non-clinician. So we have to highlight that also, and also hand team. Um, hand team, yeah, still still considered as award, even though we got uh, first runner of photography session. Uh, sorry, competition. Okay, that's all I have for the uh, data for uh, 2017.
publication linkages and awards. But uh, we now we need to talk about the what's for future in Nosral. So because we just uh, uh, UM just uh, um, received the the recognition. We are now in top one hundred in eighty seven. So more work and I, I don't call it burden, but we have to work with UM to uh, make sure that. Maybe we are in top 50 because UM always aim higher. So, so what should we do? So, uh, of course, hope with the, the the new government they will give more research grant. Uh, we don't, don't know because without research grant we cannot go any further to fund our st study. So we also need to um, increase or produce more high impact publication and research. Increase research visibility. If you publish paper, but People don't cite your paper. It's nothing. It's like you keep somewhere. So we have you have to increase your research visibility. That's including um, um, there are so many way to to increase visibility. That's include uh, you have to sign up for research grade, um, and then uh, you have to register for ORCID. So um, and also um, if you have research product, you have to commercialize also. You have to commercialize your product. And also, we need to to have more um, uh, uh, quality of research and um, researchers. We need more um, um, non-clinical uh, uh, staff or uh, scientists to help our clinician, uh, uh, clinical scientists, to produce uh, quality research. And um, UM also uh, encourage our uh, researcher to publish in other type of publication such as uh, newsletter, policy papers, books, chapter in books. So this one need to be counted as our KPI also, not just in ISI. So uh, now UM, UM want to uh, encourage researcher to commercialize your research product. So we hope that Nostril in one day, I think we we going to start this 3D bio printing. I'm not sure we have to um, ask Pro Azhar because uh, I think he will start uh, this lab. Also, we actually uh, we already start our cell therapy services for orthopedic procedure. This one under uh, our GMP lab in Nostril under Prof Nur Kamaro and Dr Chung Pampan. We also going to apply a uh, good lab practice for toxicology and biocompatibility testing. We also have a uh, ISO 17025 certified for testing method. Okay, that's all I have. So, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Miss Wiley, for insightful thought protecting us about the publication and awards and whatnot. I would like to call upon Prof. Professor Tukul Tukul again one more time to give some token of appreciation to our beloved uh, Ms. Wiley.